Okay, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Marty Mascari. I'm with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging. Um, we welcome you all this morning um, for our webinar, Preparing for Cognitive Incapacity, um, Why It's Important and the Nightmares You Risk. Um, and it's my understanding we're going to hear some, um, some pretty telling stories today about what risks you take by not being prepared. So, um, so welcome to you all. Um, for those of you that are new, um, we, um, I have posted a couple of times in the, um, in the chat already, and I'll post it again here in a couple of minutes, a link to download the presenter slides in PDF format. If you want to save those or print those off and take notes on them, whatever you want to do with them. You will also receive them in a follow-up email that will go out um, usually um, within 12 to 24 hours after we're done with the webinar um, that has CEO information and everything in it. Um, so you'll receive that. And then also in a second follow-up, probably about a week or 10 days from now, you'll receive another email that will have a link to the recording um, for today's presentation up on YouTube. And we encourage you to share that with anybody that um, you might know that, that the information you collected today might help. Um, we're doing this to help people. And, and so uh, feel free to share it far and wide to as many people as you can um, that we can make a difference. So I'm gonna welcome she uh, Sheila Williamson with Heyman Hogue. And, and, and if you could advance the slide, Rex, um, we're going to talk about the CEUs for those of you uh, professionals that are on that are looking for continuing education units um, for your participation today. Um, Rex, can you we advance to slide two? Uh, oh, I did. Mm -mm. It's not. You, you, sometimes, sometimes you, you might have to um, unshare it and reshare it. I've had that problem before where what's showing out What's showing on my screen is not the same thing that's showing up. There you go. Did I get it? I got yeah. it. Perfect. Sheila, do you want to tell us about CEUs? Well, good morning to those of you who were or weren't on in the beginning when I've been talking. Um, I am uh, Sheila Williamson with Hayman Hogan. Our goal here today is to completely educate you. We're not trying to sell you anything. We're not trying to sell our services. We're not trying to promote our services. Although, in full disclosure, this is what we do for a living. Yes, um, we have nine attorneys, and that is what they do for a living. However, that is not what this is today. This is strictly educational. Like he said, we want this education shared far and wide so that, it, you know, it's our hope that we help several people. Now, if you, if we can help you with a continuing education credit, we'd be happy to. This is very simple. There's two forms that I need back for you, from you. It is a sign-in sheet and an eval which I know that those of you that do see uh, continuing education, you're used to doing those. Um, I will send those to Marty as soon as we get off of this. Then he will send them to you, or you could email me directly at Sheila at HeymanHogue.com, and I will send them to you this afternoon. Then all you do is scan them back to me, and then I will be happy to email you your certificates. Very good. Thank you so much. In addition to that, um, um, as we're reapplying for our funding, um, um, which we started to do in December, um, we really need to be doing an evaluation of all of these as well and, and uh, collecting and compiling that information. Um, I used to do it only when I did CEUs, when, when the CEUs came for me, um, but we need to do that on all of them. So as you close out today from Zoom, you will, uh, a pop-up survey, a, a, a Google Forms survey will pop up and we're asking if you would please um, uh, uh, complete that as well. Um, I, I know it's two different um, evaluations, but, um, but we need that for, um, for our funding sources in order to defend our funding as we go forward and hopefully continue to be able to offer things like this. <clears throat> Thank you all so much for that. And um, uh, Sheila, I'm gonna let you um, introduce um, Rex and Austin and get us going. Um, 
Heyman Hogue is a, there are two, well, there are three partners now, but they're two founding partners of Heyman Hogue. And you're fortunate enough today to have Rex Hogue, who is one of the founding partners. Rex has practiced for over 25 years. He is a, a trust guru. People all over the state of Texas uh, contact Rex to ask him questions about trusts and what they do. And there's probably very few instances that he has not seen in his practice. So the questions that you have, he can, I'm certain that he can answer. With him is Austin. And I think several of you have met Austin before on here. Austin has been with us for a few months now, but Austin has six years of experience and a lot of it in guardianship. So he, he is going to share some active cases with you today that are, yes, sad, but they are important for you to know what can happen to people and what is happening out there for people that have not planned. And then Rex is going to share success stories of people that did and what happened to them. And it's so much less and it's, it's so much easier that it is going to end on a positive note, I promise you. So, um, and I hope and pray that Austin and Rex can help you with your patients uh, or, or clients, whatever you uh, term them, and your own families as well. And I'm going to mute myself and let Austin and Rex take it away. All right. Thank you all for watching. We hope we, you will find this helpful. We're talking about cognitive decline, the importance of planning, and the nightmares it avoids. I will be clear, we are not addressing all aspects of cognitive decline. We are specifically addressing the legal aspects. There is a lot of other information out there about other aspects of it, but I want to make it clear that we're not dealing with those. We know some good information, but uh, we want to talk about the legal aspects of this. All right, so when when you notice that a loved one uh, is experiencing cognitive decline, uh, you often notice that based on their decision making. They start to make irrational decisions that they wouldn't have made previously, uh, on different scams, uh, making decisions not to go seek medical treatment. Uh, and as, as a relative or, or just somebody that cares about them, your natural inclination is, I want to step in and help them. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the hurdles that, that arise when a third party tries to step in uh, and, and help somebody. Uh, there are various laws that, that protect an individual's uh, right to make their own decisions regarding the finances of medical care. Uh, and when a third party tries to step in, those hurdles, we, we like to refer to those uh, as, as administrative dragons. Uh, we like to use a, a metaphor uh, that you have to fight a dragon in order uh, to, to carry out, uh, carry, uh, carry for some of the to decline. Uh, what, what these hurdles boil down to is the inability of a third party uh, to sign the first party's uh, name to documents. Uh, so there are uh, different ways that a third party can step in and do that. Uh, we're gonna talk about what happens if there's no pre-planning, and then we're gonna talk about if you plan in advance, uh, how much easier that can be. Uh, Rex, I'm sorry, Austin, if I can ask you, and, and there's a little bit of an echo with your voice, and it's, it's, it, we're getting not all the words. I don't know if, if talking into the speaker, I know the computer's I'm not in front of you, but I've had a couple of people say that the sound's not clear. And I don't know if it's an echo or what, but I, I was just going to ask if see, maybe if you could move closer to the computer and let's see if that solves the issue for us. Sorry about that. Right. I'll, and, and I'll speak up to make it a little clearer, but the microphone is actually not on the computer. It's it's on a camera further away from us. But, but, that, but what you just did made, made a big difference. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, dealing with incapacity, there's basically three legal ways to do it or three legal tools. The first is a power of attorney. And a power of attorney, the principal gives the agent a power of attorney. It's really an invitation to third parties to let the agent act on their behalf. Here's the problem. There's two things you can do with an invitation. You can accept it or you can reject it. Way too often powers of attorney are rejected 
by institutions who you need to get their uh, cooperation to get something done. If your powers of attorney fail or you don't have them, then a guardianship is plan B. Um, you have a choice of what your plan Bs are. This is the first one. In a guardianship, I define that as the court supervised management of assets for someone who is legally incompetent. Some people refer to this as living probate. The third option or the second plan B is a living trust. And we're gonna show you that it can replace the powers of attorney it can provide the necessary substitute signature without going to court. It avoids guardianship and probate, and it can even provide instructions for the incapacitated trust maker's care. We're going to give some examples of that uh, today. And so when you're trying to care for somebody uh, financially, uh, they can own assets uh, if, if they're individually owned or even in some instances where they're jointly owned. You as a third party encounter some issues being able to access those assets and using the incapacitated person's own funds to take care of them. Uh, a bank is not going to let just anybody walk in off the street. Uh, and that what you say, they're not going to let you access those funds. Uh, so if you haven't done anything in advance uh, and you become incapacitated, uh, then guardianship tends to be the answer. Uh, to, to access those funds. So there's, there's two different types of guardianship. They tend to be combined together in most instances. Uh, but in Texas, there is a, a preference in the courts uh, to seek the least restrictive alternatives to care for something. Guardianship is intended to be the last resort. Uh, so it can be difficult to get, even though it's clearly needed. Um, there is guardianship of the state and guardian of person. Sometimes you do both together. Guardian of the state is getting you authority as the third party to access the incapacitated <clears throat> person's finances uh, and sign on their behalf so that you can use their funds to take care of them. Guardian of the person uh, is getting you as a third party authorization to talk to doctors, read medical records, um, and make decisions uh, for the incapacitated person. One of the things that uh, we'll note here is that guardianship becomes an issue if a person owns assets in their own name, or if two or more people own assets in their own name and one becomes incapacitated. Yeah, so guardianship uh, and probate are caused by the same problem. The problem is you're incapacitated, you can't sign the necessary documents to manage or transfer assets. Uh, so guardianship and probate both solve the problem during different circumstances where you have a judge authorize the substitute signature. Uh, and frequently, they end up being the only solution to the problem. If somebody is sufficiently incapacitated, it's too late for them to do any planning. We have to get a court to weigh in and give a third party authorization. So, uh, these Relying on a guardianship is, is not the best solution. Uh, there are options to pre-plan uh, that are far superior to guardianship. Uh, and, and then we're going to talk through some of the guardianship cases I've been involved in and show you why you don't want to wait to file a guardianship. It's far better to plan in advance. Rex and Austin, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but people are having a hard time hearing you. Either move closer to the microphone or speak up louder, please. I can hear you fine, but some people are having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Guardianship leads to a lot of time. It can take months to get it in place. It costs a lot of money. It's going to involve at least two lawyers and a doctor. Um, frequently a social study that come out of the estate. It involves a lot of going to court. It usually takes multiple hearings with at least two lawyers. It involves a loss of control. Um, the incapacitated person no longer has control and often the family feels like they don't have any control either. It involves a loss of dignity. It's embarrassing to go to court 
and testify that someone you love is incapacitated and it's not any fun for them. Um, it also creates a major asset protection problem because it opens the door for creditors and predators that would otherwise be shut. All they have to do is attach their claim to that probate or guardianship estate. All right, I'm gonna talk through a couple of different guardianship cases that I've, I've worked through the years. Uh, I have obviously changed the names of the people involved to protect their identities. Uh, but some of the details that are going to shock your conscience come straight from the case. So there's nothing to exaggerate how these things happen. Uh, so let's talk about Luz. Uh, Luz went for a drive one day by herself, and we're not really sure where she intended to go, uh, but she essentially did a round trip of North Texas. Uh, after the trip took place, uh, her children went to her car and found gas station receipts uh, in Tyler, in Waxahachie, uh, and then ultimately she ended up in Arlington where she called and said that she was lost. Uh, after that took place, um, we, uh, there was a, a doctor's evaluation that was done, she had dementia, uh, and when we went to uh, file the case, we needed to get a, a new evaluation form signed by the doctor for the guardianship that has to be signed within 120 days of filing the application. So even though there had just been uh, an evaluation, we had to get a new form signed by the doctor. The doctor uh, refused to sign the new form, even though he had just seen this lady in person. So we had to get her in for uh, a new evaluation. Uh, and and that, that took time. So while, while we were waiting uh, to to argue with, with this uh, professional to, to get a new uh, evaluation form signed. Uh, Luz went for a walk one evening, she tripped and fell, uh, and she hurt herself. Uh, she, she broke her wrist and I think she broke her hip as well. Uh, so she was rushed to the doctor and they took her to the hospital and then she was tra transferred to a rehab facility, which created a lot of problems uh, logistically for getting her short of the guardianship case. Her kids needed to be able to take care of her yesterday, but we were still trying to fight with the guardianship process to get authority to make those medical decisions. Uh, ultimately, we did get the guardianship put in place and they were able to take care of her, uh, but then we ran into significant issues with accounting for income and expenditures for loops. Uh, so as guardian of the estate, her daughter uh, was uh, using her funds to take care of her. So she took her out to dinner one night, paid for her dinner. Well, when we submitted the accounting to the court to show how the money was spent, the court took issue that she went to a steakhouse uh, and had, a, I think, a $27 meal. They said, no, she couldn't have eaten that much. She can't spend that, uh, which was ridiculous. And then, not long after that, she instructed her daughter to use her funds to buy the grandkids some Christmas gifts. The court didn't like that either. It said that she couldn't authorize that. Uh, and so... They're not going to take gifts back from the grandkids. Uh, the children of, the, of Luz, they had to reimburse Luz for the money that was spent. Uh, and it caused a lot of unnecessary headache uh, and a lot of uh, administrative fees were spent just trying to get to the bottom of those accounting issues. Had Luz had good planning in place, i.e. a trust, here's what would have happened. In a nutshell, once she uh, called her daughter and they realized mom's affected by dementia, they could have taken over as trustees. They could have managed all this without having to go get an, another doctor's report. They wouldn't have had to account to the courts. This would have been quick, smooth, um, and inexpensive. Next, I want to talk about Samuel. Uh, he went for a drive. He lived here in Metroplex. Uh, he was driving out to Lake Fork in East Texas to, to do some fishing. Uh, on his way, uh, he ended up in Carroll. Uh, he got confused, got lost. Uh, the gas station clerk thankfully uh, called the authorities and, uh, and he was transported to the local hospital. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he, when he didn't return home at the, the time that his family was expecting him, uh, his family tried to find him. Uh, and whenever they called 
uh, local hospitals along the way, called the authorities, they were not able to provide uh, his location uh, because uh, of, of HIPAA restrictions. They couldn't say which hospital he was being cared for. Uh, and since we essentially couldn't find him uh, and, and we needed to find him and take care of him, uh, we had to file a, a temporary guardianship, uh, it's sometimes called an emergency guardianship, uh, to override the HIPAA protection so that we could figure out where he was being kept uh, and how he was being treated. Uh, and through this process, uh, and, and really any guardianship, there is a, a loss of civil rights that takes place. Uh, so we've been talking about how a third party is granted authority to make decisions, uh, but on the flip side of that, the incapacitated person is stripped of various rights. Uh, so in this process, uh, he was stripped of his rights to make his own medical decisions or, or, or even be able to drive. Uh, and that's, that's kind of an extreme consequence when we really just need to figure out where he was and make medical decisions for him. Now, had Samuel had a trust plan in place that provided instructions for his care and that sort of thing, most of this would not have happened. He would have still been taken to the hospital, but they would have had HIPAA authorizations. They could have talked to the hospital. The police would have talked to them, and there would have been no loss of his civil rights. Now, let's talk about Veronica. Uh, this one's particularly heartbreaking. Uh, Veronica uh, lived out in the country. And, uh, her husband passed away. Uh, so she moved to the Dallas area to be closer to her children. Uh, she did this right as COVID was ramping up and got to the point where she wasn't able to go out and meet people. She wasn't socialized. So while she was there by herself at her house, uh, she became very depressed. Uh, so she resorted to social media for interactions with other people. And when she did that, she met uh, a man online that claimed to be romantically interested in her and came up with an elaborate story for how he wanted her to send her money, send him money, uh, so that he could buy a house for them to live in in another state. Uh, and so what, what ended up happening is uh, she sent $50,000 first, uh, and then her kids found out about that and they tried to talk to the police and uh, the police literally said, we can't do anything about it. Uh, and tried to talk to the bank. So well, you don't have authority to access finances, can't do anything about it. Uh, once, so we had to file a guardianship to take control of her finances and prevent further transactions from happening. And by the time that we had a guardianship established and we evaluated her finances, she had transferred $900,000 to a scammer online. Uh, the vast majority of her life savings, she transferred away. Uh, and we're, this is an ongoing case. We're in a, a sticky predicament here that this doesn't fit the classic example of cognitive decline of, of Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, this is something that, that is unique. And so it's been very difficult to get the court uh, to work with us, even though it's, it's very apparent she's not making rational decisions due to her condition. Uh, it's been very difficult to get the guardianship established uh, and, and get it operating. Uh, so as the, the guardianship has been uh, was pending, uh, she found out and she started selling family heirlooms within her house to try and get money to leave the state and go be with this uh, alleged a uh, man that has a romantic interest in her. Uh, so a lot of her personal possessions have been liquidated. Uh, and in a guardianship like this, where there's emergency costs, uh, emergency actions, and then later convert to a full guardianship, um, I'm, I'm expecting the, the cost to her end up near $40,000. It's gonna be very expensive. Um, had Veronica had a trust plan in place, her kids would have been able to move in much faster once the first 50000 was spent. They could have stepped in uh, with the trust properly designed and put a stop to this. It would have saved her, you know, all told, close to a million dollars. So we've talked about these cases, but now I'm going to talk about the process of guardianship using Carl and Myra and their three children, Peter, Paul, and Mary. 
Myra was terminally ill. She couldn't manage assets or herself. Carl has Alzheimer's. Their powers of attorney have failed. They have a $500,000 home. Carl has a $500,000 IRA. They have about $1.8 million in investment accounts managed in Carl's name. They have about $200,000 in joint bank accounts, and their old POAs are not valid. That's in part because Texas changed the law back in 2017, and they invalidated a lot of prior uh, powers of attorney. I don't think that's what they intended. That just was the effect of it. Now, what the kids need is to get assets to provide for Carl and Myra. They need to sell a house because it's no longer feasible for either, either one of them to live there. They need funds for Myra to be in a facility. <clears throat> Carl is better off in a facility and he's not resisting that. Well, they started this process about a year ago. They got a doctor's report for both of them. They hired an attorney to file two different guardianship applications proposing Peter as the financial guardian. Um, they got notice to interested parties, which in this case was each other and the kids. Um, let me just ask Austin, how likely is it that the court is going to appoint the same ad litem for both of these cases? It's pretty rare that that happens. It's very nice when it does, though, because that, that greatly reduces costs. Okay, so uh, in this particular case, we were able to get the judge to do both, but that is relatively rare. The judge didn't have to do that. And until they get this guardianship in place, the kids have no access to the financial information or the assets. They do have information from statements they found at the house. A court investigator does a background check on Peter. Um, now the courts were backlogged on background checks that one of the effects of COVID is they just weren't able to conduct them. Well, this case can't go forward until that background check has been done and they don't have access to the information. Um, so Peter has to qualify for bond. Actually, he would have to do that whether they had access or not, but it's up to 3% of the $3 million estate. It's $90,000. And he's going to have to come up with that. What if he can't qualify? Well, the bottom line is he's not going to be the guardian. They're going to appoint somebody else. And that's going to be more expensive. Um, now, this could ultimately be repaid in probate. But Peter has to also undergo approved training as a guardian. Now, a guardianship, I tell people that it's a 12-step program. There's really 12 basic steps to get it in place. Um, but probably the minimum cost of a high net worth guardianship is going to be $40,000, maybe more. But we get to go through this twice here. We're talking $80,000 to get a guardianship in place for them. Um, and it could get worse if there's creditors or predators hanging out there. The annual cost is likely to be at least $10,000 minimum. It's usually going to be more in an estate this size, and that's each. It seems like a constant stream of surprises, and it's going to go on for as long as the ward is alive. It goes on until the ward can prove they're either no longer incapacitated or the war dies. This kind of thing is otherwise disastrous for good estate planning, business and asset protection planning. Um, and another thing that we were able to do was get Carl moved to the same facility as a year, uh, same facility as Myra a year ago. And even though in 2020, it was impossible to weigh the RMD and Carl's, I'm sorry, it was possible to weigh the RMD in Carl's IRA. Peter could not get the authority to do that in time. So that's another problem with cognitive decline is that you can't necessarily carry out tasks. And if you don't file those uh, required minimum distributions or you don't make them and get them from the institution to make those, there's penalties involved, tax penalties. Um, 
and that created some unnecessary tax that could have been avoided in that particular year. Now, we've done all this. Is the guardianship in place option? Not yet. Okay. Um, now, we're going to move on and look at this case as though they had done a trust three years ago, right before Kyra, uh, Myra was diagnosed. At that time, Carl was not yet showing the signs of Alzheimer's. One of the problems with Alzheimer's uh, or any other cognitive decline is that person may seem fine one day and the next day they've, it's almost like they stepped off the cliff. Um, well, how does a typical trust, how's it going to work assuming that they get the assets transferred properly? Well, it's going to set it up so that they've got successor trustees in place, but not all trusts are the same. In this case, it worked well. We had an incapacity panel that we could use without having to rely on doctor's reports, without having to rely on courts to determine incapacity. Um, Myra felt it was best if Carl served with Mary. Now, that was not um, necessary. Um, I mean, as it turned out, Carl was not a good choice, but at the time they set it up, Mary did not realize uh, the issues that Carl had. Carl preferred Peter to serve with him. Um, Mary was a little bit closer. They compromised and had Carl with a 40% for both serve with Peter, Paul, and Mary with 20% each. Now, here was the nice thing. When Carl was no longer able to serve, people who were already used to dealing with Peter, Paul, and Mary. They dealt with them, and nobody really had to know. When Mary needed a facility, the trust provided suitability instructions for her care. That's an important feature that she may not be in the position to tell us what she really wanted. That was pre-planned. Um, there are two facilities that fit the criteria. Both of them are, are within 20 minutes of Mary's home, the one who, at their home and Mary's home. So it's not going to be terribly far away from where they're used to. And they picked the place closest to Mary because she had a little more time and she lived closer to them than the boys did. And once Myra was in the facility, the kids took care of the bills. They could spend time with Myra. Um, Mary realized Carl couldn't stay at home. The kids served as the incapacity panel. Um, they could have removed Carl as a trustee if that was necessary. I've been in situations where we left um, an incapacitated trustee in place because the institution was used to dealing with the other trustees. So that works very well when you've got good planning in place. Um, now they can move Carl to a facility without a doctor's statement. They just have to get the facility to accept them. And the trust even instructed them to use the same facility for both and even put them in the same room. I have seen cases where they didn't wind up in the same facility. Is that a common thing that happens in guardianship? Yeah, never guaranteed that. Yeah. And and that's really sad that they're they're now apart from the love of their life, and they could be in the same room with good planning. Um, the trust avoided the unnecessary R and D in 2020 because they had somebody who could exercise the authority to tell the institution not to make it. Um, no fuss or issues with third party to handle things the way that this happened. All right, so earlier when we first started this, we, we showed this portion of the slide that talked about when an asset is individually owned or it's owned with other uh, parties in each of their individual capacities. When you become incapacitated, you end up needing to do guardianship. Uh, but now we're going to show you what happens when you have a trust. So when, when a trust holds title to an asset, uh, it provides some significant advantages. So it replaces the power of attorney. The power of attorney is often rejected. Um, that's very frustrating, but the trust is going to own the account. Uh, the bank can't say no to the trust. Uh, and, and therefore, the, the trust is able to avoid guardianship. Why can they not say no to the trust? Uh, 
Well, with the power of attorney, that's an invitation uh, to let a third party act on your behalf and that the bank can accept or reject that. With a trust, the, the relationship is much stronger. The, the, the trustee of the trust holds title to the account, and so they cannot reject that trustee. Um, and so in that trust, there's going to be provisions uh, that talk about how to care for somebody should they become incapacitated. Um, the trust is easy to manage, it's easy to change and update as circumstances change. Uh, and they work best when all the assets are fully aligned with the trust. Now you've done some work uh, in another firm. Um, do all trusts have those provisions? Uh, not all trusts do. Uh, they're, not every trust is the same. Uh, there's a really a, a wide array, a huge spectrum uh, of what you can get in a trust. There are very basic trusts. There are very advanced trusts that go into great detail. Uh, and at our firm, we ask very specific questions about how somebody wants to be careful under these circumstances and incorporate that in the trust funds that we do. So let's talk about what is a trust. Uh, it, it's a contract that involves three parties. Uh, you've got the trust maker, uh, they, they create the trust, and they're often called the grantor, set or trustor, those are other names for them. Uh, so they create the trust. The trustee is the individual or, or corporation that is charged with carrying out the instructions in the trust. A trust is, is technically an agreement between the parties. Uh, and the last part you have is the beneficiary. That's the person who uh, benefits from the assets that are in the trust. Uh, so the trustee is charged with managing the assets for the benefit of the beneficiary. Uh, in these circumstances, typically, uh, we have a revocable living trust. Uh, the trust maker will serve in all three roles. Uh, so you create the trust, you manage your own assets, and you are the benefit of those assets. Um, so the, the trustee holds assets for the trust uh, and they have to manage the assets and distribute them according to the terms of the trust document. Uh, so any assets that are in trust avoid the need to go through the guardianship and probate process. There's no uh, substitute signature that's necessary. That trustee has authority to, to act on behalf of those assets. Uh, so while alive, uh, trusts help avoid guardianship. Uh, trusts have a lot of benefit after you pass away. I like to focus on the benefit that they have while somebody's still alive uh, to avoid this invasive guardianship process. Uh, the uh, trust-based plan can provide instructions uh, that are very specific to the individual that made the plan uh, for how they want to be cared for. Uh, guardianship, that doesn't exist. You have to guess what they would have wanted. Um, you, in a trust, you can uh, see how uh, a successor trustee uh, can do managing the assets. Uh, you get to choose who your successor trustees are, uh, which uh, hopefully uh, are people that you trust, um, and, and they will do a good job for you. Uh, trusts are easy. Uh, a lot of people think of trust and they well, okay, Jerry Jones and Mark Cuban, they need any, any trust. Uh, trusts are, are for almost all people would benefit from them. They're easy to manage, easy to change, easy to update, uh, and, and they work the best when the, all the assets are aligned properly with the trust. Um. We're now going to look at uh, some cases where people had trusts in place. Teresa was approached by yet another stranger wanting a $5,000 donation. So she asked her trustee, who was her son, to send $5,000 to his charity. Now, she had never given to this kind of charity before. She had never given to that specific charity. Um, well, her son said he would take care of it, but they were suspicious and the children did not make the donation. The next day, she had forgotten all about it. We have seen this come up um, and some people think it might be terrible for the trustee say, mom, I'll take care of that. Mom doesn't worry about it anymore. She believes it's been done but it's not in her interest to go give away the money. They don't know how long she's going to need that money. 
And what would happen in a case like this with the guardianship? This isn't a great position to be in. Um, there's, it, it, if there's no trust planning done, you have to rely on guardianship. Well, then she's still in control of her assets and she could have already sent the $5,000 to multiple strangers. Uh, and and this, this gets kind of difficult because uh, if you need to go get a guardianship, I, I don't know of an attorney here in town that would take a guardianship case for less than a $5,000 retainer. And so you're, you're, you're spending five grand to save five grand. That, that's a tough position to, to have third parties have to make on your behalf. Uh, and it, it can be difficult. Dale enjoyed going out to eat and he had always been frugal, but he suddenly started leaving large tips. Um, and when I say large tips, he would go out and get a $10 meal and leave a, anywhere from a $100 tip to the waitress to $500 even. Well, that was just way out of proportion to what was, you know, what he had been getting and way out of his normal characteristics. Well, the Sun Trust team removed Dale's access to the bank account. Uh, but they told Dale, Dad, we're having problems with the bank here. We're going to have a card when you go to eat. You call us, we'll pay for the meal. And they would put a reasonable tip on there. And if Dale said, hey, put a $100 tip on there, Dad, we'll take care of it. But he had no idea. He had lost all sense of how much money he had. And he really could not afford, uh, because of medical expenses, to be paying for that kind of stuff. Um, but what would have happened in a guardianship case here? Well, this is going to be difficult for the same reason as the last slide. Uh, yeah, a couple hundred dollars here, a couple hundred dollars there. Um, that, that's, that's not a significant amount of money for, for most people. So you go to argue that case with the judge and say, well, he's leaving a hundred dollars to this waitress. And the judge may say, well, Maybe he just fancies the waitress. Uh, and so that by itself is not going to be compelling enough to get a guardianship in a lot of circumstances. Uh, you would have to couple that with a uh, medical diagnosis of severe incapacitation uh, in order to do that. Uh, so in, in cases where there's $900,000 going out of the estate, yeah, the judge is going to step in, even if all the evidence isn't there, they'll step in to, to protect the person. But in a case like this, I would have a very hard time arguing this without very comprehensive medical records to demonstrate there's an incapacitation. I actually had a case one time where we were discussing this issue in court and it was brought up and the judge looked at me and he said, Mr. Hoke, what is your hourly rate? At the time it was $400 an hour. He asked the other attorney, what is your hourly rate? It's $400 an hour. And he said, y'all have spent more than $100 of your time talking about this issue. So, yeah, very difficult position to be in. Julia loved online clothes shopping, but unfortunately, she would forget what she already had. And she had a large enough house that she had several different closets that she would go and put stuff in. Well, when she moved to a facility, her kids in cleaning out the house found 250 pairs of pants. Most of them had been worn once or not at all. 73 of them still had tags, but they had no receipts. Now, what the kids did is they cut off her accounts. They cut off her ability to order clothes. And they told her that that had to do with the facility. But if she would let them know what they wanted, they would order stuff for her. Then realizing that they couldn't take those clothes back, here's what they would do. About once a week, they would take one or two pairs of pants to mom and say, hey mom, that order you told us to make the other day, here it is. Well, by that time, Julia couldn't remember what she had ordered and she'd be so excited to see her new pants. They even discovered that they could take pants to her and say, we went ahead and took the tags off of them. Uh, they had a lot of pants to work with. It's kind of comical, but kind of sad. Um, but she appreciated the care by her kids. She was angry with them for what she perceived them to be cutting off 
her access to the account, which is exactly what happened. But when she realized that, oh, you really are taking care of this, she felt really good about it. And that's another one of those that I'm going to guess you're going to tell me is tough in a guardianship. Yeah, this, this fact pattern would be difficult, uh, especially for Julia, uh, because it, you're having this court hearing and you're having to establish a pattern uh, of reckless spending that is wasting her estate. Uh, and so you may end up in a position having to put her on the witness stand and grilling her about why she's spending so much money. Uh, and in a circumstance like that, she's going to feel attacked. Uh, she's she's going to feel like everybody's being critical of her decisions. They're meddling in her life decisions. Uh, and this can often uh, sever relationships uh, between family members. I've seen that happen before. It's not a pleasant experience for everybody involved. Uh, and ideally, you would just avoid the need of, of having to go through this. Let me ask you this uh, question. After what we've looked at, what is the best way to deal with incapacity? Is it guardianship or a trust? Oh, it's trust by far, by far. Yeah, so when, when you're going through guardianship, um, there, there are a lot of administrative issues that you have to deal with, uh, a lot of different costs that, that come out of the guardianship. You, you've got administrative costs, uh, which would be uh, attorney's fees, uh, for the person who's applying to be the guardian, there's attorney's fees for the attorney ad litem that's appointed by the court to represent the incapacitated person. Uh, there's court costs. Uh, it, it can all be very expensive. Uh, and then beyond, uh, and that's just the administrative costs. There are a handful of other different types of costs that are, that are going to come up through all of this. And you get in a situation of trying to figure out um, which rules apply to these costs, which rules apply to these costs, um, who gets paid first. Uh, once somebody ultimately passes away, and you've got to deal with probate costs and file a notice uh, of death of the ward in the guardianship case, then you've got to open up probate to, to continue the case after they've passed away. Uh, there are significant expenses there. Um, and if, if the uh, state is large enough, we might be dealing with state taxes and uh, Form 706 that might have to get filed. Uh, and there's, there's creditors that could pop out of the woodwork. Uh, and creditors in a situation like this is particularly difficult because if you've got an incapacitated person uh, and you file a guardianship, there's a notice that gets posted uh, in the local paper for creditors to file their claims against the estate. Uh, and so you could have uh, a contractor said, oh yeah, I, I did some repairs on her house. Uh, here's my invoice. Uh, it hasn't been paid yet, why don't you go ahead and pay me? If you're a third party, how are you gonna verify that what this person is saying is correct? Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to deal with creditors uh, in uh, a guardianship or even probate. So you definitely want to avoid all of that because all of these people that they're sticking their hand out, they get paid first before who you would actually want to receive your money. Take a look at that on the next slide. Oh, excuse me, a couple of slides. Um, so let, let's talk about how assets can pass upon death. Uh, a common one is joint with right of survivorship. Uh, that's especially uh, popular with married couples. One person passes away and goes to the other. Um, it's not ideal to spend they both pass, and what happens after that? Uh, if there are beneficiary designations that you can make on certain assets, uh, kind of like life insurance, uh, IRAs, 401ks, uh, you can name beneficiaries. You can name beneficiaries on those types of accounts. Uh, and if everything is perfect and nothing changes between the time you make that designation and the time you pass away, then those will pay out to the beneficiaries that you've named. However, life changes, uh, and that's not always those uh, beneficiary designations. What I call playing by the box, uh, it's kind of a snapshot uh, of what you want to happen, but things change, and they can't really accommodate changes the way uh, a well-crafted uh, state plan could. Uh, so, when you have assets that are owned by a trust, then you get to dictate how the assets are going to pass. And then you can set up a set of conditional formatting to say, if this person passes away first, I want to go to this person. You have a lot more uh, 
flexibility to accommodate the changes that happen in life. Uh, and then the last one, uh, if, if you have an account, say you've got a single person, they didn't make a beneficiary designation, they don't have somebody else listed on their account, uh, they don't have a trust, that forces things to go through probate. Uh, I mean, even if they have a will, uh, that's not going to avoid probate. In fact, the will it only gets used in probate. That's a common misconception. Uh, so when you have assets owned that way, uh, you've got to go to court and get a judge to sign an order allowing the assets to pass. Uh, whereas if you had a trust that owned those assets, you wouldn't have to go through those administrative hoops with the court. The trustee would have authority to carry out your wishes typically as quickly as you can get a death certificate for the person that passed away. And all of these methods get assets to beneficiaries, but they're not equal in the way they do it. So we're going to take a quick look at the administrative rules involved. And one of the questions that uh, we ask on the panel is, which administrative rules apply? The more you have, the more expensive it is to administer an estate. Now, you always have to look at case law, banking regulations, and the Internal Revenue Code, and the Treasury regulations. But joint with right of survivorship, beneficiary designations, and TOD have a common set of rules. In each state where you have owners, survivors, beneficiaries, or where assets are located, you may have to deal with various laws. The Internal Revenue Code has special bad tax rules that apply to these three methods of passing assets. But other laws that can come into play may be the Estates or Probate Code, the Property Code, the Insurance Code, and the Family Code. And we're going to give you an example of how those can come up. If you have a trust, you deal with one set of laws, the state's trust code, one state, not multiple states. Now, if it's owned individually, it's gonna go through probate in each state where the person owned a real property interest. Now, that isn't the same from between all the states. For example, in Texas, mineral interests are real property interests, but in some states, mineral interest or personal property interest. So the rules are not the same from state to state. Just be aware that there's all this out here and we're gonna look at uh, case history um, to illustrate this. All right, we're gonna talk about probate now. Um, and that, that's probably an unfamiliar term to most of you. Uh, so the, the technical legal definition uh, is probate uh, is to prove up the will. Uh, or what does prove up the will mean then? Uh, the, the lay definition, I would say, is it's the court supervised transfer of assets for someone who has passed away. Uh, when somebody passes away, they don't have a will, or, or even if they do, there's nothing automatic. Your, your person that you want to take care of your, your distributions, they can't just go to the bank and make distributions, they have to go through the court process. Uh, and when people call me and they want to know, like, how much does probate cost and how long does it take? Uh, no attorney that's honest can really tell you those things. Uh, probate cost varies widely uh, and the length of time that it takes to get through probate varies as well, especially from county to county. Uh, and really what, what, when somebody calls us to talk about probate, what should they really be asking? Uh, well, who gets paid first and who's in control of that process? So in Texas, funeral and last illness of up to $15,000 each if the court approves is the first thing paid. Now, when you see a little phrase like if the court approves, the way courts approve stuff is lawyers go to court and argue it, and that is expensive. Next comes the family allowance if there's a qualifying family members. I'm not gonna spend any real time talking about who those might be, but the surviving spouse is one of them. Um, then comes the cost of administration, attorney's fees, court costs, executor fees, the cost of managing, safekeeping, and preserving the estate, and any unpaid guardianship fees. And a lot of times those guardianship fees, people would delay guardianships thinking that the other side's fees will never be paid, but they do get paid in probate. Secured claims and tax liens. Unpaid child support and interest. By the way, I heard everybody cheering for this one. 
taxes, penalties, and interest. Imagine in the state of Texas, five people stand in front of the IRS. Isn't that great? Uh, then the cost of confinement, if somebody was in jail or prison, um, repayment of the medical expenses. You know, you mentioned somebody who, didn't the guy that went up in the hospital actually spend a little bit of time in jail? Or am I thinking of another case? It's a different case. Okay. Well, if he had, the state conceivably can make a claim. Repayment of medical assistance, other claims. Um, I'm going to share this real quickly. We had a client at who owned rental properties. He died. The renter said, well, it says I'm supposed to pay Joe. Joe has died. I'm not going to pay Joe until y'all have a court order. Well, it took them a year to get to the probate point. Um, meanwhile, the renter withheld the rent. The kids had to pay uh, for all of that, and they couldn't do anything about it. He's not violating his lease because Joe isn't there to pay. Now, the minute they got approval, he wrote him a check for the full amount. Needless to say, interest wasn't included. So that's an example of uh, something that can go haywire and probate. Now, who isn't on this list? Well, it's the family. They're not on the list. Your family and loved ones are last on the list. The expenses of probate until these are all paid, the family gets nothing. Now, who controls this process? I wish I could tell you that it was lawyers and the courts, but it isn't. It's all these people who want to make claims. One of the reasons no one can tell you what probate's going to cost or how long it will take, they don't know what kind of claims are going to be made. We don't know how long it will take to resolve those claims. Those are just total unknowns. So that's why probate is not, um, I mean, Texas has a pretty good probate system, but when you look at it this way, it's not that great. Well, we have a definition of probate. Yeah, probate is really a lawsuit to file against yourself at your own expense to protect your disgruntled heirs, your creditors, and your future lawsuit creditors. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to file a lawsuit against yourself or would you like to avoid that? All right, we're going to look at another longer case study. Um, Merlene had three children, Carrie, Don, and Norma. Norma lived here. She died on a Sunday. Eight days later, Norma came to see us to probate her mom's will. 50% of the assets passed by right of survivorship or transfer on death designation, and those were mostly financial assets. Another 30% passed by beneficiary designations like life insurance and retirement plans. The remaining 20% was going to pass through her will. It involved a home here and another piece of property in Wisconsin. Both of her sons were in second marriages. Norma, she was in her first marriage. She lived here. Um, she had kids and she had no issues. Um, but the hot real estate market here in Texas explained why she was very anxious to get this done. So she can't sell the Texas real estate until after the Texas probate. She's gone and gotten letters to seminary so that she can start conducting business. And that's going to take a few weeks, perhaps a few months, depending on the situation. They can't sell the Wisconsin real estate until after the Texas probate and then a Wisconsin probate. Um, now, 80% of her one-third goes outright within a month, but Norma has no protection on it. We're going to show you how that could come into play later. Um, then Harry, he, would, he lived in Illinois, his second marriage. He had minor children from prior to the marriage. Now, Harry died two days after Norma came to see us to probate mom's will. We had told Norma she brought our package back to us on Tuesday. And we told her that Thursday, we would have documents ready for her to sign. This was before electronic stop filing. We would get it filed in the court. We worked really hard to do it. And we did not hear from her. The reason is her brother died. She went to Illinois for the funeral and somehow forgot to take her phone. Well, what happened with Harry? 
80% of his one third passed by right of survivorship. Illinois and Texas have the same law. This is where we're looking at the property codes and the probate codes of the two states because both Texas law and Illinois law apply here. In both states, those assets vest in five days. So since he lived more than five days, they're now his, they're gonna go by his plan. The beneficiary designations that in the TOD vest immediately upon his death. Harry had a simple will with his new wife, meaning everything went to her. That is not what mom wanted. She did not care for the lady. 20% uh, from the will, well, he did not survive the 30-day period in the will. So that's going to go to his minor children, but they're going to have to go through a guardianship in Illinois. Merlin lost control of 100% of what went to Harry in some shape, form, or fashion, and 80% of it is going to somebody she did not even like. Don, he actually flew home on Monday right before Norma came to uh, see us. She dropped Don and his family off at the airport. Now, when he got home, he was told that uh, he had a message from his bank telling him he needed to come in and open a new account for the POD and write a survivorship that had paid. So he told him he'd be there the next day. Now he lives in Wisconsin. Again, he's in a second marriage. She's got kids from prior to the marriage, but at least his are adults. Well, the next morning, um, sorry, skipped, uh, forgot to move the slide forward. Um, Tuesday, he received divorce papers before he left the house. He spends the day getting a lawyer. Wednesday, Harry dies. So he put the inheritance in a joint account and goes to the funeral instead of taking time to open a new account. Now, when I first heard this, I thought, that is the stupidest thing I could imagine. And yet I realized Harry was, an, I'm sorry, Don, was kind of stressed. He lost his mom. He just got home. He finds out he's going through divorce, and now he's lost his brother. I can see where he wasn't thinking clearly. So I try not to judge too harshly. But under Wisconsin law, when he put his separate property into that joint account, his wife became entitled to one third of it. That means that Merlin lost control of one sixth of what went to him. So Merlin has lost control of some of these assets by using right of survivorship, beneficiary designations, and transfer on death designations to transfer assets. They seem simple, but they may not work out that way. Then there were two probates, one in Texas, one in Wisconsin, um, and those were non-liquid assets, home and property, so one of the problems is they're going to have to pull money out of the financial assets to pay for these probates. And since those financial assets went to the kids, the kids are going to have to pull out what they got. Well, needless to say, well, who are they not going to get it from? They're not going to get anything from Harry. His wife isn't going to pay for anything. So that meant Norma and Don wound up paying the cost of the probate. Um, and somebody's going to have to maintain those properties until they're sold. That fell on Norma because of Don going through a divorce. If uh, the husband's name were still on the deeds, we see that sometimes an additional probate will be necessary in each state where his name is on real property. That was not an issue here, but I did want to mention it because we see it often enough to bring it up. Now, one third went to each child, but Every case is different. Um, slightly different set of facts would have drastically altered the outcome in this case. Now, Norma asked me, um, you know, she's going to get a third. It wasn't that simple. She got all the assets, but she didn't get any other benefits. Uh, she had to front the cost for the probates in both states. Harry's estate couldn't assist because of his death. Don couldn't assist because of his divorce. It's a good thing that Norma was in a position to do that. It's just a shame she had to use her inheritance to do it right off the bat. 
Now, she could be paid back in lives upon the sale of the properties. It could have been a lot worse, but it could also have been a lot better. I'll show you how. So, of Harry's one third, 80% went to his new wife, who Marlene never liked. 20% goes to probate. Um, what's left is going to minor children. Grandchildren will go through the guardianship and get the non liquid real estate assets. Oh, wow. That's and they're going to get control of it at 18 or 21. Another looming disaster. Um, and uh, Norma saw that as just a complete disaster. Don's one third, his soon to be ex wife, is going to get one sixth of what went to him. Uh, the remainder is going to go to him, but he doesn't get any other benefits. Overall, for Don, very poor but it's not the complete disaster of Harry's. But compared to getting everything instead of losing a sixth, not good. Now, what if Merlene had used a trust? Completely different results, no probates. That would have made it faster and less expensive to sell both of the properties. There would have been no guardianships for minor children. We wouldn't have had to mess with two other states' laws in multiple areas of law. 100% of the benefits after the low cost to those Marlene wanted to see benefit would have gone to them. Um, a trust administration is cheaper than uh, a comparable probate. I've never seen a case where that's not true. Um, Norma's one third part came from the sale of real estate. All would have been protected against future divorce. That's now become a concern because both of her brothers have been through a divorce and one of them's going through a second. Uh, she's seen that that didn't work well. Now her marriage is good and she's not real worried about it, but you can't ignore it. It would have all been protected from existing creditors or future lawsuit creditors. Harry's one third, 100% would have gone to Harry's minor children. There would have been no guardianship. It would have been controlled by a trustee until the children were older, let's say aged 30, 35, 40, something like that. It could have been used for their education and medical expenses. Instead, they got cash at age 18. Um, I'm sure that they all got a pretty nice car, um, but don't know that it got used for their college education. Don't know that they used it for future medical expenses. Um, it all would have been protected against future divorces. Of course, they made that easy by not having anything left. It all would have been protected from existing creditors, and it all would have been protected from future lawsuits. That money could have set her grandchildren up for life, but instead, it's probably been blunt. Uh, certainly 80% of it went to somebody she didn't care for. Don's one third, he would have benefited from 100% of it. His soon-to-be ex-wife, would have gotten nothing. All would have been protected against the future divorce. And now Don uh, kind of looks at it like two marriages, two divorces. He's not doing very well in that department. It all would have been protected against existing creditors in any future lawsuits. After death, the trust would have been owned or controlled. Um, assets owned by the trust avoid probate. We have distribution and instructions for all the assets. We have faster access to assets, faster and easier to administer, fewer complex rules than right of survivorship, beneficiary designations, and probate. It involves only one state law, and it provides more certainty of results than other distribution results. Now, you may think, well, what does this have to do with dementia or uh, in mental incapacity. We've seen cases where people who were mentally unstable removed assets. Uh, they had a will that said it's going here and they would have another family come in and convince them to make it right of survivorship to that beneficiary. And, they, and we had it happen in a nursing home one time when she was near death. Very sad that family members would do that. But people get greedy. Trust protect them from that because they don't have the ability at that point to go give it to a new person. And trust me, they do still try. 
Now, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, going to get that around here. <laughs> so, uh, when you have somebody that's, that's incapacitated, it's very common if, if it's a parent, one of the kids will uh, move into the house to, to really help take care of that parent. Uh, so, here we've got an example of, of Johnny and Jenny. Johnny moved in with mother to take care of her. Uh, and then, once she died, Johnny continued to live there rent free and tried to use his mom's funds to pay for all of the, the expenses like utilities. Uh, a trust would have prohibited that. Uh, the trust it would have dictated which assets were supposed to go to which people, uh, and it could have had language to prevent Johnny from taking advantage of the situation. Uh, and doing probate law, I see this very, very commonly. There's very commonly a child that tries to take advantage of the situation uh, and live in a place without any lift. Yeah, unfortunately, that's uh, fairly common. They kind of think that mom agreed to pay for them from now on, but the minute mom dies, she no longer needs water, electricity, anything like that. Now we're going to talk about predator dragons and asset protection. Um, asset protection is just protecting and preserving assets from unnecessary loss. Now, predator dragons, um, they're the biggest risk to your estate plan is your child's spouse's divorce lawyer. When somebody has dementia, they're really not thinking about that at all. If they don't have pre-planning in place, chances are good whatever they pass to their kids, it's not going to go in such a way as to protect that child from a divorce. They're not going to protect it from the debts of the beneficiaries. Um, and extraordinary bills can come into play. I know a lady who she was putting dishes up in her cabinet. She had to step up on a step stool. She fell off. She broke her leg. She was in the hospital for 12 days, $324,000 medical bill. Um, that case is still ongoing. She's had to have surgery, and I'm kind of following along because she was a friend of mine. Um, but there's been over $500,000, and I can't help but wonder have her parents protected her where what she inherits won't be lost in those medical bills. Um, and we're not against paying medical bills, by the way. Uh, we realize some of you work in that field, and it's not the medical people, but right now our medical system's kind of a mess. Predator threats, future lawsuits. Um, does a beneficiary have a high-risk job? What state do they live in? Not every state protects assets equally. Um, if, trust me, we've got clients that from New York and California, I think them as being um, states that they just don't provide asset protection at all. They are very, uh, very creditor friendly, no help to beneficiaries at all. Well, how would the loss of those inherited assets affect beneficiaries? And here's the thing, when these things come up, here's what I hear. This just came out of nowhere. This flying dragon just came down and stashed assets. Not very nice of them. All right, we're going to talk about how your trust can provide for beneficiaries. And I'm trying to go quickly because we're going for an hour and 15 minutes so far. Uh, so your trust can be set up so that uh, your beneficiaries are paid outright. It's not ideal because there, there's not very good protection for the beneficiaries. Instead of a convenience trust where your beneficiary can make more requests for disbursements, it's a little bit better, but it's not the best option. Uh, we feel the best option is what we call the heritage trust, where assets are held in trust for the beneficiaries. And while it's held in trust, there is protection uh, from their creditors, from their uh, divorce attorneys, uh, very strong protection. Uh, and, and it can be set up to, to it's a dynasty trust that greatly uh, reduces the state taxes that have to be paid to the IRS. So we've got two quick case histories here. Um, the first one, Carrie was a young lady who inherited money from her parents. Not long after she got the money, she was involved in a car accident. Somebody tried to go around her at an intersection, flipped her bumper, caused her to veer off. She T-boned a van loaded daycare kids. It killed the driver and two kids. Um, that resulted in a lawsuit 
and a $9.8 million judgment in the case, the jury found Carrie 10% liable and the guy who hit her 90% liable. Now, how much does she have to pay? A lot of people think, well, $980,000, which would have been less than a third of what she actually inherited. But the accident took place in Colorado. In Colorado, the rule is if you're 10% liable, you can pay for all of it. In Texas, if you were in a similar accident, you would have to be 50% liable before you had to pay for all of it. And in California, if you've heard about the accident, you can pay for all of it. I hope that was a joke. Compare that to what happened to Ted. One night, Ted got a little too much elbow exercise, failed to negotiate the bridge over the Chappaquiddick River, and Mary Jo Kopechny died. Kopechny family tried to sue Ted Kennedy for millions, but they could not collect. Why? Because the assets that came to Ted Kennedy from his parents were in what we call a heritage trust. When he went through a divorce in 1982, his wife Joan discovered not only could she not get anything, but the assets in that trust didn't even count against him in the divorce case. He remarried a lady named Vicki. When he died, Vicki discovered like Jackie Kennedy and Ethel Kennedy before her, her name wasn't Kennedy, she was not a beneficiary. She didn't get anything. Those are things that the Heritage Trust can do for a family. Yeah, let's talk about Ron real quick. So Ron inherited six hundred thousand uh, dollars. About half of that was in an IRA. Uh, he was married. Uh, he, he took RMDs out of the IRA. He invested as well. Uh, Ron used uh, non-IRA funds to pay for her debt, school, and bought them a home with a non-IRA three hundred thousand. So all that was left of his inheritance was the IRA portion. Amy filed for divorce. Uh, and here in Texas, an IRA is, is typically considered separate property. However, income off of separate property is considered community property. So with the commingled assets, the IRA, IRA became available for her to receive uh, through the divorce. And this could have been prevented with proper trust planning. Uh, another case, Angie and Jack. Uh, Angie's mother died. She left her $400,000. Jack talked her into letting him buy a business with the money. He had always learned a business and he had some initial success, but the company got sued. They lost the lawsuit. They had to go through a business bankruptcy and they thought that would wipe out the debt. No, it did not. They still owed the business loan. They had to go through personal bankruptcy. Then they got divorced and he got remarried. And she now has nothing but two young kids. $400,000 could have been left to her. All of it could have been protected, but none of it was. Um, at this point, we're going to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to have Austin explain just a little bit about how we put a plan together. Yeah, when you go to make a plan to avoid guardianship, avoid the issues that come with probate. Um, you want to meet with uh, a skilled attorney that will take the time uh, to ask you the appropriate questions to customize your plan to fit your needs. If it's your family situation, your financial situation, you don't want to just download a power of attorney document off the internet and sign it uh, because oftentimes those are defective. They're intended for different purposes. They're very problematic. So you definitely want to meet with an attorney to really discuss what your goals are and objectives are. Uh, and not every law firm is the same. Uh, there are a lot of law firms that have kind of cookie cutter, this is our form for this purpose, and therefore we're gonna slap your names on this, sign it, and here you go, here's your estate plan. Uh, when choosing a law firm, you wanna make sure you select a law firm that's gonna sit down with you, talk about the family situation, talk about your finances, and make sure that the plan that they design is custom for your needs. So when you don't do planning, that's when guardianship and probate can come into play. Uh, and as we've, we've talked uh, extensively about, uh, when you don't have planning in place, that's when the dragons can attack. And that's when things are forced to go through guardianship, forced to go through probate, the dragons are, are gonna come after uh, the money and make things much more difficult uh, for everybody.
You know, the hardest thing about this presentation, by the way, was getting pictures of live dragons. Um, now, after planning, if it's done correctly, we have the same guy, he's, uh, but we're gonna give his estate defenses. We're gonna put his assets behind the castle. The dragons will still come, but now he has a knight who will go out and slay the dragons. We've enjoyed presenting this. Um, we're gonna turn it back over to um, Marty, I guess. I, we forgot to establish that, or maybe it's Sheila. But. Well, Sheila, I think uh, Sheila had been going through several of the questions. Sheila, do you want to post some of the questions? Yes, um, we have several. Okay, um, the first one, Anne has three questions. And, okay, the first one is, we have medical authorization with our parent here with her doctor, her PCP. Would this have been acceptable for the lost man in Terrell? And that depends. If that's a form that's specifically for that doctor's practice, then that would not necessarily apply to other hospitals and other practices. It's, it's better to have a universal document prepared uh, in a law firm that would be accepted everywhere uh, and is enforceable everywhere. And the other question is, how are those other institutions going to get it? So. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Next, Angela wants to know, please explain what you mean by the powers of attorney failed. If an institution doesn't accept them and there's reasons they won't, they don't know if you're still alive. If you're dead, that power of attorney died with you. They don't know if it's been revoked. They don't know if it's valid. Um, one of the things that happened in 2017 is when the state legislature changed the rules, it took only a few months before we started hearing from clients, their old attorneys have been told they're outdated. So there's a lot of reasons that powers of attorney fail. In my 29 plus years, uh, it, I've seen powers of attorney fail at least as often as they have succeeded. Okay, this is Ann again. In 2021, the 87th Texas legislature created an offense called financial abuse of elderly individuals. This new law makes it a crime to offer to exert undue influence or otherwise wrongfully take, use, or financially abuse elderly people. Just the $100,000 should be considered theft. Should not matter if she had a trust in place. This can be anyone. This makes no sense to Ann. Please explain why this was not considered theft and why, and I can't, I, I can't see any more to this one. So there's a, oh, why? This, it doesn't say why, and there was more to it, but you, I can't see that. So anyway. Um, the best I can say is we did not say that it's not theft. Um, it is theft, it is wrong to take people's money. Um, if she was perhaps talking about a case where <clears throat> the parent is starting to spend money out of a trust and the kids are preventing it, what they're doing is preventing the parent from going and blowing money they may need to take care of themselves. Um, and that's not the kids taking the money for their own benefit, that's the kids protecting the parents. So there's two completely different aspects. If we could hear the whole question, we might get a better. Yeah, let me, let me expand on that a little bit. Um, yes, there is a criminal avenue to pursue the people. Uh, if this is related to the scamming situation that I mentioned, uh, there, there are criminal remedies to go after the people for theft. In order to bring those charges, you have to have somebody uh, authorized on behalf of the incapacitated person in order to bring those charges. So they work together. It's not one or the other. And it can be difficult to arrange that if uh, the key witness in the case can't really testify. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, Denisa asks, when there is a living trust, how do you determine when the person is incapacitated? That depends on the definition in the trust. One of the things that we do, we have a five-part definition in, I'm going to say, 99% of our trusts. One of them is an incapacity panel where I can choose 
three people who I trust that if I couldn't effectively manage my assets, that they could remove me as a trustee. Um, that is the easiest, fastest, cheapest way to do it. Every other definition, it works, but it's going to take longer. And if there is no definition, the only way to do it is to go to court and prove their incapacity. Okay, next question from Joyce. Does Texas honor durable powers and trust, durable powers of attorney and trust that were done in another state? That is going to depend. Uh, they will honor trust done in another state because trusts are contracts and they're valid all over the country. Now, the problem with the trust from another state is it's going to be interpreted by Texas law um, unless it's an irrevocable trust. But the problem with powers of attorney is it's got to meet the Texas statutory power of attorney form and Unfortunately, those documents are so state to state, frequently institutions don't honor and it. It's not the state of Texas that would honor it, by the way, it's institutions in the state of Texas. Okay, next question from Ann. What if the court assigns a guardianship to someone for their parents, despite positive and involved support from their daughter and sons? What grounds do the children have to be reassigned as the parent's guardian? Also, who monitors these guardians to ensure they are safe and their finances remain sound? So if, if, if one child is appointed as a guardian, other children want to be guardian instead, uh, the answer there is litigation. We file a lawsuit within the guardianship uh, and try and demonstrate that the youth that was chosen as the guardian by the court actually is not a good fit, and you have to allege reasons why. Uh, and that, that's just a, a big fight in court. Now, who oversees guardian? The, the court does. Uh, on an annual basis, the guardian has to file a report. Uh, guardian, a person is kind of a fill in the blank form to say where the ward, uh, the incapacity person is living, what are their conditions, those kinds of things. Guardian of the estate, they have to file an annual accounting that shows how every penny came in and came out of the estate and explain why expenditures were made. Uh, so there, there is extensive court oversight and, and a lot of protections in place, which then creates a lot of administrative costs in having to pay attorneys to prepare those kinds of things. And I've seen cases where the court administrator uh, would pick out things that you just would not think they would be looking at, but they're, they can be very thorough in overlooking it. The other challenge I see is, uh, look, you know, they, for example, they appointed Peter, but Paul or Mary wants to do it. Can they pay for the bond? That's gonna be a key thing because that bond is on the individual who's the guardian, not necessarily the estate. Okay, next question is from Lisa. My mother is in total denial about estate planning despite my pleas. I am her only child, she is a widow. Is my only option to sue her for guardianship someday? If I am granted guardianship or any of my personal assets at risk by any of her creditors or people who may sue her estate? Lisa's assets would not be subject to her mom's creditors. Creditors may bring claims against the guardianship estate. Um, and it would be a shame if you had to sue mom for guardianship. Um, but yeah, that's unfortunate. Sometimes you can't get them to plan. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered that whole question. Yeah, that where Lisa's assets can come into play is if she misappropriated some of her mother's funds. Uh, even though Lisa would be the ultimate beneficiary under that circumstance, if she misappropriates funds, uh, she would have to reimburse the estate. Uh, there could even be criminal uh, charges brought for fraud. Uh, so that would be the only circumstance where I would say her money would become involved. Okay, 
Now this is a good one for both of you. This is from Kimberly. Do you have any recommendation for how I can address this with my parents in the state of Missouri? They are 82 and 81 and just recently did a reverse mortgage to also try and get rid of some credit card debt, but have no other plans. And my sister and I are trying to guide them somehow. We do have colleagues in, Minif uh, in Missouri. We would be happy to give someone a referral. So just get in touch with us. Okay. And we're only licensed in Texas, so we, we can prepare Texas plans, but we're not able to prepare Missouri plans. But we know attorneys in every state in the country. Okay. All right, now here is a good, this is good, Christy. From the early examples of the two people that both got lost and ended up in the hospital, how would the authorities or hospital staff know whether they had a trust or not? Would they depend on the well, dementia patient to tell them? No, it'd be the, the third party that's trying to care for the person. You, you, that, the, the, the child typically is who they choose for this. They would present that for their parent. They, they would ideally have a copy of the documents or at least have access to the documents that they could send to the hospital. Well, and the other thing is when you talk about the trust assets, you're talking about financial assets, not really the medical. Uh, that would come into play when somebody's trying to access uh, financial assets and suddenly find out that they do have a trust and they have to deal with the trustee on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this, is, this is bad. I'm needing to place two ladies I have taken care of in my home. One son took her money and got her evicted from her assisted living and the other in California. I'm the payee, but not guardian because she was taking care of them. You can see where that, can I place them? No, uh, one of them has no family and the other person, because there's two people, the other one has no family involvement whatsoever. Yeah, so you don't have to be a family member to become a guardian. Uh, under, under Texas law, at least, you have to you apply for guardianship. You have to send out notices to family members if they exist, so they have an opportunity to step up. But if they don't, um, anybody can serve as a guardian. Uh, so you, if you try to, to place them in a home uh, and they say that they need an authority uh, that you don't have, then guardianship is probably going to be the answer. Next one. My mother is moving to Texas following my father's passing. She is 72 in good health. We have no legal documents in place yet. We are thinking of buying a home together. Would it be better to have the home in only my name so that should something happen to her, I don't lose the home? That is a question that there would be a lot of facts we would have to know to effectively answer that. I've seen it done three ways, all mom's house, all daughters or sons, and a combination. Um, there are so many factors that go into that. It, it would take a while to know the answer. Yeah. If this person wants to set up a phone call with us for later, we can get into the details and answer that. Um, and I think the, the answer really needs to be they need to seek legal advice from, from an attorney. Yes. And, 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 um, and yeah, they, they need to seek legal advice. Yes. Yes. Okay. The next one. If a parent, which is a widower, has little assets but lots of debt, what is the minimal legal protection they should seek? Well, debts can be dealt with in different ways. Uh, while somebody's alive, uh, you can file bankruptcy and get rid of a lot of debts. But then that can be problematic. Uh, like if you person owes their, their health care providers money and file bankruptcy, they can't shield those providers. Everybody gets discharged and then they can't, the healthcare providers are going to continue providing service after they've been told they're not going to get paid. Uh, so that can be problematic. But after somebody passes away, debts can be dealt with through the probate process 
There's a very, frankly, it's a complicated process for creditors to file their claims. And more often than not, it's not done properly. And if they don't do it properly, those claims can be barred. Uh, so the probate can be an effective tool to deal with those debts uh, if they're not dealt with while somebody's still alive. Sheila, I don't know if you saw, there's three questions in the Q&A, and I can run those. Oh, no, I did not. Uh, no, it's all right. I, I can start here, right? Good. Uh, my 82-year-old sister is leaving the rehab today. She's still weak, um, but can come home. Group, I'm sorry, can come home. Group have reached out um, to me to help her in the home. What should I be aware of? Signing paper work. I guess her sister's um, leaving rehab, going home, and, and she wants to make sure what she should be aware of in signing the paperwork as, as groups are, are, I'm assuming home health services or, or physical therapy is, is approaching her for home health services. Uh, it just depends on the paperwork that she's having to sign. Uh, if they let her sign in the, that capacity, then she can. But if there's paperwork that requires power of attorney or guardianship, um, then she may need to talk to an attorney uh, for a consultation and see what needs to be done. And her sister may need to do planning to make that process work well. Yeah. If it's possible for her to do it, that would be a good thing to do. Jackie, if I didn't get that right, you might add, add to that. I, I apologize if I beat that up. Um, Faye asks, um, what happens if mom dies without a will and leaves three adult children and a house, but mom has a husband who died in 2006 without a will? Do both estates have to be probated and how? If the house was co-owned by both people, then yes, both estates would need to be probated. That can be a real mess because uh, it's been 16 years since he died. You, your options are limited after four years, but it still has to be done. Uh, that's just more complicated. More, more the reason for planning. It's uh, you know we, um, and and then Annette asks, um, can I initiate my own trust or see an attorney? I have a, a will only. Absolutely, we even know somebody who can help on that. Yeah, you just have to, um, uh, Annette, you need to seek um, a, an attorney who does estates. And um, that's all I have. Um, did, that's did all you I see too. Very good. <laughs> very good. Well, once again, y'all, just absolutely um, impressive, incredible information. Thank you so very much. Sheila, thank you for all your help with it. Y'all, thank you for joining us, but I do, I, I do want Sheila real quick to go over the CEU stuff again, if you would. Yes, several people have reached out to me already, which I appreciate that. So I'm uh, as soon as we get off here, I'm going to send Marty these forms. Um, they, I will need two forms back from you. Um, this, the eval form, right, you know, evaluating this uh, workshop, and then the, um, the sign-in sheet. And then as soon as I get those sent back to me, then I will be happy to send you your certificate. Great. In addition to that, um, I, I spoke earlier about there'll be an additional survey that pops up as you close out of your, um, out of your Zoom, out of this meeting today. Um, we ask that you um, complete that. We need that um, for our funding sources to defend our funding so that we can continue to put on these uh, webinars. So we appreciate your help in doing that. If you go to the last slide for us, Rex, and, and, and we want to um, let you guys know that um, coming up next um, with, ha with Haman Hogue is going to be why it's essential to have your COVID ice pack ready. And stay tuned for that. Um, a link to that information will go out also with the follow-up email so that you can register for that. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, everyone.